Hi, I'm Derek Heidemann. I'm the director of collection and research here at Oldster Ridge Village. And today we're in the Armed and Equipped exhibit to talk about some of the rifles we have uh, in our collection here at the museum. We're really lucky to have a great collection, a very large collection of firearms here at Oldster Ridge Village. But probably my favorite component are the rifles like these right here that were made in Worcester County or New England more generally in the period from 1820 to 1840. So I've pulled out a few examples for us to take a look at today. The two in front here were made by Silas Allen Jr., a very well-known and influential gunmaker um, from Shrewsbury, Massachusetts, who learned from John Mason, one of the first rifle makers in, in New England. Um, we have a not identified Silas Allen, but a gun that is very much in the Silas Allen school. And then we have another one here that's a William Tucker. Um, William Tucker was a gunsmith over in Brimfield, just down the road. And in fact, this gun was carried by uh, Alfred Hitchcock, who served in the Brimfield Rifle Company, a volunteer militia company in the 1820s and 1830s. So before we get into some of the decorative elements and, and other things that set these apart as rifles, the first thing we should really talk about is the barrel, because the barrel is what really makes this a rifle. Um, if you come to a musket demo here at the museum, the mechanics of the gun work very much the same as a musket. You have a flint lock, a piece of flint strikes steel, that creates sparks and sets off the gun. And with a musket, the inside of the barrel is basically just a, a smooth tube. So when the ball is pushed out, depending on how tightly the ball is actually wrapped inside there or fitted inside there, um, sometimes it just gets pushed out, sometimes it might rattle around a little bit as it comes out, and that can really impact the accuracy. The difference with a rifle barrel is that it has typically a much heavier barrel, usually octagonal, uh, made out of iron just like a musket barrel, um, but the inside is what's the biggest difference. So inside, after a gunsmith had used a boring machine like the one behind me to bore it out and get a consistent bore, they would then use this right here. It's called a rifling bench. And what that is, is a very systematic cutter that cuts a series of grooves called rifling inside the barrel. In fact, that's how these get their name from the rifled grooves inside of there. So it's going to cut a series of those grooves going through that make almost one complete rotation from the breech all the way up to the muzzle. And what that does, is it imparts a spin on the bullet, which means that ballistically it's much, much more stable over a longer distance, which makes it a lot more accurate over a longer distance as well. In the militia, you would load a rifle using a ball cartridge, starting by pouring a small amount of powder into the pan to prime, and then placing the rifle between your knees to pour the remainder of the powder down inside the barrel. The advantage to the ball cartridge is that the ball was already wrapped in a greased patch to speed up the loading process and give you the accuracy of patching the ball. The grease on the patch was to enable it to be loaded faster, but it did still require a little bit more force to actually ram down a ball on a rifle when loading. After the ramming was complete, the rifle would then be ready to fire. So we talked about some of the makers here that made some of these rifles. We have Silas Allen Jr., John Mason, who is his mentor, William Tucker, but there were lots of other rifle makers um, here in New England, and really specifically in Worcester County is where a lot of them got their start. So people like Alvin Pratt, the names we mentioned here, these are all people that started here in Worcester County um, in the early 19th century. Funny enough, rifles are really not that common here in New England before 1800. It's much more common to see smoothbore guns like muskets and fowling pieces which are basically like shotguns for bird hunting. Uh, but rifles don't really become common around here until after 1800, especially from the 18-teens through the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. Um, part of the reason for that is right around the War of 1812, you see a massive spike in the number of volunteer militia companies that exist, which make up about a quarter of the militia in the state of Massachusetts. Um, these are companies that have uniforms, they're, they're very well drilled, they're much more professional soldiers, but still operating within the militia system system that's controlled by the state of Massachusetts. And about 37 companies by the point of the 1830s that are functioning in Massachusetts are actually rifle companies. That means they're armed with rifles just like these here. Um, in fact, again, this one here was used by a member of the, the Brimfield Rifle Company. Um, so we get a sense of exactly what these rifles would have looked like when carried by members of the militia. So aside from militia service, there were also just a lot of individuals who owned these for target shooting, like this very large heavy barreled Silas Allen rifle, which really is far too 
too heavy to be carried around. It's much more of a bench rifle for firing at targets. Um, people might go to turkey shoots or do other types of hunting, squirrel hunting, things like that. So there's, there's a good demand for rifles that turns up in the early 19th century. And as a result, um, not only is there, there a, a great spike in, in how many rifles are made, but a pretty uniquely New England school that develops for how these rifles look and feel. So when, when looking at these rifles, a lot of different elements we can talk about, some of which set them aside as New England rifles. Some of them are more kind of generic to the time period that you see with rifle building throughout the country, whether you're down in Kentucky, Pennsylvania, Ohio, um, New York, different places like that. But we'll talk about all these different factors um, to give you a sense of how we know all these are New England rifles beyond the fact that we know who some of the makers were who carried them. Um, so the first thing right off the bat, we're looking at all four of these rifles and really all the rifles we have in our collection is they're all stocked with cherry. So cherry is a very common wood that's used in New England uh, for furniture, for, for rifle building, even for building all sorts of different firearms, pistols. Uh, the, the manufacturer of pistols here in Sturbridge, Gibbs Tiffany in the 1830s was using cherry for a lot of their stocks for their pistols. So a very, very common New England wood that's used. Um, the second most common is gonna be walnut. And then behind that, you do see a few examples that survive of tiger maple or, or curly maple, which is kind of the iconic wood we think of when we think of the American law rifle. So cherry is a very common wood that we see. And looking at the actual kind of the architecture of the stocks, the couple of different styles that we see as well, um, which again, aren't uniquely New England, but it seems like they're trying to find what makes the New England style when looking at all these. And all of this is with the caveat that these were very often custom made rifles for the actual shooters. So because of that, they have, you know, the purchasers are gonna have the ability to say, well, I want it to be this long or have it shaped this way, whatever it might be, because they are all custom. Um, but we have some here, like the William Tucker rifle, that has what is a much more typical type of, of long rifle stock that we see throughout the United States. So it's a full stock with the stock going all the way down to the muzzle, to the end of the barrel there. Um, it has kind of the, the typical drop in the stock here you see on Kentucky rifles with a cheek piece on the side. It has this very angular sharp butt plate on there. Uh, with the octagonal facets that actually mirror what's going on with the barrel here. So that's that's kind of what you commonly think of when you think of a long rifle of this period that's being made in various parts of the country. But you do see some variation within that. Um, we have one right here that's actually a very similar style, same kind of shape of the butt and, and butt plate here, but it's only a half stock. So the stock only extends about halfway down the barrel, which does make it balance a little bit better. Um, and it's just copying some of the more, more European sporting styles that are coming out in this time period. Um, we have a couple of other longer stocks right here. This one in the front here is, is the most different. You do see a few different examples like this. We actually have a couple in our collection here that instead of the much more angular stock that we associate with long rifles, it has a much more graceful curved stock that's very typical of English fouling guns or even French fouling guns of the 18th century. So there's this mixture of different, different aesthetics um, as New England gunsmiths try to figure out what that uniquely um, New, New England stock should, should look like on these rifles. So getting away from the wood, we can talk about some of the hardware. So really the heart of the gun, aside from the barrel, is gonna be the lock. All the locks on these guns are all English imports. So these are being made by people like the Ketlin family, Richard Ashmore, people who are making these by the thousands of the period and shipping them over to the United States, basically for sale at hardware stores. Um, so you could go to a hardware store, buy all these relatively inexpensive English locks that were actually really high quality um, and then engrave them a little bit to customize for different makers or different styles that people would request and then put those on the gun. So they're really great locks that you see and, and pretty much unanimous for all these New England guns in the time period. Uh, whether it's a rifle or a New England militia musket, very, very common to see. The two in the front here are still in their original flint configuration. The two up above have actually been converted to the percussion system. So that shows that sometime in the late 1820s, 30s, or 40s, they were updated to a newer ignition system to continue to use these guns. So they did see a long working life. So aside from ignition system, we can get into some of the decorative hardware. So rifles in general in the period are going to have what's called a patch box in the butt here. So it's a little cavity. It can actually open up the door here and you can see the cavity inside where you would store your patches for wrapping the ball to fire it. 
Um, that door closes up and a lot of these Worcester County rifles, they just basically have a straight door with a terminus that is often referred to nowadays as a ball and spire. So it has a round ball here with this, this kind of spike design on the end. There are a couple different variations of that. Um, there are some other variations too that you see like this one on the target rifle where it actually has these decorative side pieces all engraved as well um, with an end that actually comes up into a star pattern, which is not unique to New England. That's something you do see with some of the Pennsylvania rifles as well. Um, and then there are other ones, like we have a Silas Allen rifle that has a horse head patch box. That's another style that you see throughout the country, but the patch box are, are very common on these because it allows you to store those patches and, and other cleaning tools for the gun as well. Um, although not all New England rifles do have patch boxes. This one in the front does not actually have one, again, copying more of that English style that you might see or that fouling gun style. Um, and looking at the trigger guards, most of them have an English style of trigger guard um, if they're built in this Fowler style with a little pineapple shape on the end and that's copying the English style of these really nice sporting guns in the period. Um, and then for the ones that are more traditional long rifle in appearance that actually have the handrail here for your fingers to wrap around, they look very similar to what you'd see in other parts of the country. The only distinctive thing is this little tiny piece that juts out from the front of the, the, front of the trigger guard which is a uniquely New England thing. The last thing is really the side plate here. So I'll spin this rifle around and we can see the side plates here, which are effectively washers that hold the lock bolts that go through to secure the lock onto the side of the gun. And the very common style you'll see here in New England is the Comet and Oval, usually engraved in some way, but not always. Uh, and then aside from that, there's, there's a lot of other types of little decoration. There's silver wire inlay that you'll see. There's wrist escutcheons. Um, in some cases when the barrels have keys to hold them in place, these little flat keys that wedge them in. They might have little silver or brass scutcheon plates that are inlet inside there. So there's there's numerous ways these could have been customized for the individual owners that carried them in the militia or for their own sport, sporting use. Um, and just some really great variations to look at as you look across all these different examples we have in the museum's collection. So I hope you've enjoyed this look at these few New England rifles from our collection. Um, all of these rifles are actually on permanent display and armed and equipped. So next time you come out to the museum, I definitely urge you to, to come and take a look in person.